I work on rejuvenation biotechnology, and I'm going to tell you what that is, um, and I'm going to tell you why it's the sweet swat spot between prevention and treatment. Aging is bad for you. The older you are, the... <laughs> The, the older you are, the sicker you probably are. And this is just talking about different types of disease in different types of ways. I don't have to go through the details. It's also incredibly expensive. All of you know that Medicare is going bust and it's the same all over the, all over the developed world. Fundamentally, that's because even though countries are getting richer, this is the US um, gross national product, the rate at which medical expenditure is going up is even faster. And therefore, the proportion of the gross national product that is spent on medical care is rising ridiculously rapidly. This is only a period of 50 years, and it's gone up by from just about um, $4, in the pound, uh, $4 trillion to, um, uh, to 16. So that's basically a change of 5% to 18% of the GDP. It's completely extraordinary. So the thing is, what's going on here? Why is it that... Even though we've been so successful over the past 100 or 200 years in getting on top of most infectious diseases, we have made such pitifully little progress with regard to the diseases of old age. This is a, you know, it's a paradox, really, and we, it, we, it's important to think about what it could possibly be, what could be the reason. So let's start with defining aging. This is what aging is. It's the accumulation of damage in the body, damage at the molecular level and at the cellular level and at the systemic level that is okay for a while. The body is set up to tolerate a certain amount of that damage, but eventually we have so much damage that the body starts to work less well, and the diseases and disabilities of old age emerge. So this is a really important thing that people often get wrong. This is, I think it's fair to call it, bizarrely underappreciated. <laughs> um, aging causes the diseases of old age. There is no magic distinction between, quote, aging itself and the diseases of old age, those diseases are simply aspects of the later stages of aging. They're very widespread, of course, in the developed world now that we're on top of most infectious diseases. They're staggeringly costly, as I've already explained, but they are universal. Everybody gets them. As long as you don't get one of the others and die of it, you're going to get all of the diseases of old age. <laughs> and that also means that they're not medically curable in the strict sense of the word cure. We are never going to have a therapy that you can apply once to somebody and make them non-aging, the way you can apply a therapy once to somebody who's got tuberculosis and eliminate the infection from the body such that they will never have tuberculosis again unless they get reinfected. It's just not like that for the diseases of old age. But that does not mean that we can't do anything with medicine. They are amenable to medical intervention, it's just that we have to go about it in a different way. Let me explain what this actually means financially in terms of um, the misguidedness of how money is spent on medical research. $30 billion is roughly what the National Institutes of Health, which is also, of course, shut down at the moment, um, is, is, spe is spent each year on medical research. It's the major funder of medical research in the USA. It's got an institute within it called the National Institute on Aging, which gets 3% of the budget, $1 billion. Sounds all right, really, doesn't it? Sounds like a respectable amount of money. Unfortunately, hardly any of that money actually goes on trying to do anything about aging. Um, the Division of Aging Biology, which is part of the National Institute on Aging, accounts for only one-sixth of it. The rest of it goes on Alzheimer's disease, a specific disease of aging, and also on things like social gerontology, making sure that you know, there are um, ramps on, on, on curbs and so on. So uh, there's only $150 million spent on the biology of aging. And as I'm saying here, most of that is spent on trying to understand aging in the same way that, you know, seismologists try to understand earthquakes. They know they're bad for you, but they're not proposing to actually do anything about them. Um, and, uh, and, and this is actually a pretty, pretty generous estimate of how much is actually spent, $10 million a year, on the actual elimination, postponement of age-related ill health. Uh, by the US government. We, a tiny little foundation, we've only been going a few years, our budget is around $5 million. That's the same order as the US government. That's pretty shocking. But we are getting somewhere. And the reason we're getting somewhere is because we're going about it in the right way. We're actually trying to attack aging in a way that could actually work. What I've told you already is that it's not possible to attack aging the way we attack infectious diseases. That's what I'm calling the geriatrics approach, and it's what dominates current medical expenditure, medical care for the elderly. It's essentially treating the pathologies of old age as if they could be eliminated from the body, which they can't, and 
it's therefore almost entirely useless. It just slightly postpones, if you're lucky, the ill health of old age, but then you, know, you get sick anyway. Um, gerontologists have known this thing for a long time, that the geriatrics approach is basically hopeless. And they've tried to figure out enough about aging to be able to, in some sense, extrapolate from the variety of rates of aging that we see in nature. Clearly we have um, some species that age much more rapidly than others. And the idea is maybe we can find something out about that, about why that is, and develop medical um, interventions on the basis of that information. Unfortunately, human beings are really rather near the top end of that spectrum of longevity already. So it's actually really difficult to find anything that nature, any, any other species is doing better than we are, and, um, and therefore to extrapolate from it. So that's not really got anywhere either. But our approach is much more practical. Our approach, is what I'm going to call the maintenance approach, says rather than trying to in some way slow down the accumulation of damage, make, the, make humans age more slowly, or to attack these pathologies, which it's basically hopeless to try to attack, let's go in and instead attack this damage that I mentioned, that's the definition of aging. This accumulating molecular and cellular changes to the body's structure and composition that eventually cause the pathologies. If we go and attack this and repair this damage periodically, then we are effectively uncoupling this process from that process. So even though metabolism is creating damage, it never reaches this pathogenic threshold. And we're pretty optimistic about this. It's really the, just the same way that we already successfully maintain and postpone the um, ill health of simple man-made machines like cars. So this car was not designed to last 100 years the way it actually has lasted. The reason it's lasted that long is because it has benefited from really comprehensive periodic maintenance. And we believe that the human body is a machine too. It's a really complicated machine, but it's still a machine, and we ought to be able to postpone the ill health of the human body in just the same way. So what does that mean in actual practical terms? Well, this is basically what it means. Rather conveniently, all of the various types of damage that accumulate in the body and that eventually contribute to age-related ill health can be classified into these seven major categories that I'm listing here. These, as you can see, are very clearly down-to-earth concrete biological phenomena, like cells dying and not being automatically replaced by the division of other cells, cells dividing when they're not supposed to, cells not dying when they are supposed to, things like that. I don't have time to go into them in detail, but what I can say is that we have good reason for confidence that this really is a comprehensive classification. First of all, it's been the same list for 30 years. You know, none of, all of these things have been major topics of study by gerontologists since at least the early 80s. Also, I've been actually explicitly challenging people to try to add to this list for at least 10 years, <laughs> and I seem to have got away with it. This is a description of aging that seems to be standing the test of time. Now, if we come back again to the relationship between ageing and age-related disease, in other words, between damage and pathology, sometimes it's simple. This business of cells dividing when they're not supposed to, that is cancer. That is synonymous with cancer. Often it's not so simple. Heart disease, there are lots of different types of heart disease. There's atherosclerosis, which is essentially the molecular garbage ac accumulating inside cells in the artery wall. There's arteriosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries, which is mainly to do with this thing at the bottom, the loss of elasticity of the extracellular matrix. Um, there's something called cardiac amyloidosis, which is really important for heart failure in the very elderly, and that's caused by something that accumulates in the spaces between cells. And finally, sometimes your heart just stops because cells in a place called the sinus node, which are responsible for actually keeping the heart beating, just die, and there aren't enough of them, so the, heart, so the heartbeat just stops happening. So lots of different things. Sometimes you've got just a single disease rather than different diseases in the same organ, but yet it's still got different types of damage. So Alzheimer's disease is characterized by tangles, which accumulate inside neurons, plaques, which accumulate outside in the spaces between neurons, and also cells dying. And we need to fix all of those things. The way we fix them is essentially by four different approaches that begin with R. Um, we sometimes want to replace things that have gone missing, we want to remove things that are accumulating undesirably, we want to sometimes repair things that we don't want to either remove or replace, and sometimes we do something preemptive, we effectively reinforce the body. This is what it comes down to if we go down my list of seven things. For cell loss, we replace the cells, and, and so on. And in more practical terms, this is what it means. Replacing cells is stem cell therapy. That's what stem cell therapy is. It's putting in cells that will divide and differentiate to replace cells that have died and not been automatically replaced by the division and differentiation of cells in the body. 
Um, as I say, I don't have time to go through all this in the 12 minutes, of which I only have one and a half left. But um, <laughs> the point is, all of these things are very concrete, specific technological ideas. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about a project that we're funding at Rice University in Houston. This is the beginning of atherosclerosis, when a perfectly self-respecting white blood cell becomes poisoned by a substance called 7-ketocholesterol and becomes this horrible thing called a foam cell. And we have found bacteria which can destroy 7-ketocholesterol. This is how we found it, using something called an enrichment culture. We published this five years ago. Um, then we found out what genes and enzymes that, that bacteria were using to actually do this. This is the result of a mass spectrometry experiment, which is how we found this. Then we modified the enzyme. We actually took the gene and messed about with it so that we could put it into human cells and the enzyme would go to the right part of the cell called the lysosome. This is showing that that's actually occurring. This is the lysosome, this is our gene, this is a, an overlay showing they're in the same place. Finally, just last year, we were able to show that it works, that we could actually protect cells in cell culture from this nasty thing, 7-ketocholesterol, by giving them this gene if it was suitably modified so that the enzyme went to the right part of the cell. The um, height of the bars is the health of the cells, basically, and the right-hand bar shows the cells that we modified in the right way. These are the negative controls, the cells that didn't have the enzyme or they had the wrong enzyme or something like that. Thank you very much. <laughs>